Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we are continuing in our sermon series, taking a look at that book of Psalms, which is right there in the middle of your Bible, uh, taking an opportunity to examine some of the more poetic verses within Scripture, right? You can go through and find genealogies, you can find histories, you can find laws, uh, but in Psalms, Proverbs, a couple other sections, uh, there's poetry, and it, it speaks to you in different ways. It speaks to each of us in different ways. And so we've been walking through that. We've had two weeks now. We looked at Psalm 121 and Psalm 130, both of which fall within a category called the Psalms of Ascents. Though they had different themes, they both had this idea of this ascension that the people of Israel would have made to the city of Jerusalem, right? Uh, if you missed any of those messages and you would like to go back and listen, those are, these are great messages to share by the way, because they speak to people in different ways. Uh, you can find those on our website. We also have an audio-only version on our website, as well as we're putting them out on uh, podcasts as well. Uh, so if you're looking for that, you can find that there. Uh, today, we are continuing with that, looking at Psalm 138. Uh, we'll take a chance to, to look at it, to examine perhaps how it speaks to us, and then we're going to use how it spoke to me as kind of our structure for today's message. But before we go into that, if you could join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for today, this chance that we've had to be able to come together and worship, uh, whether here or online. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the chance to share your message, and Lord, truly let it be your message. Move me out of the way. I pray that as I submit myself to you, that your Holy Spirit would be at work in a powerful way, that everybody who hears this would submit themselves to your Holy Spirit, to hear your truth, whatever it is that you want to say to each person, Speak now, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, because we have uh, folks joining online, it's possible that they're watching only the sermon. So I am going to read Psalm 130 again. Um, it might be helpful for you here in the room to take out the Bible, whether it be the one in the pew there, maybe on your phone, whatever, just to have Psalm 138 in front of you um, to kind of refresh yourself as we go along. But here's what it says. It's a Psalm of David. Um, it says, I give you thanks, O Lord. With my whole heart, before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day that I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. So my process over the, these past couple of weeks as I've been going through and working on, on preaching on psalms is I just write the psalm out. I've got a whiteboard in my office and I write it out and I just kind of sit with it for a while. Like I'll be working on other stuff and I'll look over and I'll read the psalm again and, and just kind of see what's rising to the surface for me. Like what stands out? And I've got a little color-coded system. You know, green is like, this brings me peace. And red is, this is kind of a weird thing that I'm not really sure. It seems like a stumbling block. And then I use orange as like, this is kind of just the odd things that I'm going to have to look up more what that means. And, and the reason I do that is, is yes, I, I sit with the commentaries, I sit with the original language, um, but it can get really easy to try and, and make it over intellectual. It's important to remember this is poetry and it's meant to speak in different ways. And so basically what I'm doing there is I'm letting the scripture speak to me. Uh, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, right before we started this series, I talked about how we can meditate on scripture. And that's what I would encourage you to do as you, as you go through your daily devotion, whatever, just take a section of scripture and focus on it and let it speak to you. Rather than trying to get down in the nitty gritty, just let it talk to you, especially when it comes to these poetic verses. Um, so as I did that with this particular psalm, there were three things that kind of bubbled up to the surface, and that's going to serve as our structure for today's message. The first 
is just kind of the, what type of psalm it is. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. Now, we've already, with Psalm 121 and 130, we've, we've had a psalm of praise, so giving, saying praise God for who he is, for how great he is. We had a psalm of penitence, recognizing the sinfulness within us, and now we have a psalm of thanksgiving. And the reason that stood out to me is, um, as I look at our culture, as I look at our world, I, I've made no secret that one of the issues that I see, and I think actually probably, quite frankly, one of the largest issues we have is a word called hubris. I learned this back in like junior year high school English class. Uh, the hubris, arrogant self-pride. And it was taught to me as the downfall of all mankind. And if you look, it seems as though when people gain more and more power, that's when that hubris becomes more and more and more prevalent, right? That, that arrogance that comes in. And that's true within our own lives. We have this hubris within us. We have this this self-centered mindset. Um, Hubris isn't always just about status and power. It's not always just about being the the Lord of things. It's being focused on yourself, thinking that you're the most important person in any given situation, right? That your preferences outlie somebody else's preferences. It's the idea of standing up to get a better view and you're forgetting the fact that everybody sitting behind you can't see now, right? And if we're all dealing with this hubris, with this arrogance, it's, it's kind of ironic because that means we're all fighting for the same piece of the pie. We're, we're all selfishly kind of coming in. And some would say that's the foundation of our modern society. You got to look out for number one, right? That's how you get ahead. But it's, it's arrogance. It's selfishness. And it's not how God designed this world to go. Uh, our, our scripture reading, uh, the first Corinthians from our early service, it talked about the different members of the body, the eye, the foot, the hand, and how while they are different, and while some may seem lowly and less regarded, they are still just as important. God intends for us to be different and yet working together. And instead, we get into this idea of status and trying to grow. We get into the idea of of greed. And it's not just greed about like tangible things like money and stuff like that, right? There is certainly that. But there's also greed when it comes to attention, when it comes to an audience, right? If if you're on social media, it's getting all those likes, getting all those views, getting all all those accolades. If if it's attention in terms of your family, uh, why do you pay more attention to this sibling than that? Why don't you spend time, get off your computer and come talk to me? You have all these, these needs, there's this greed, there's this, this is about me in this moment. And, and so we struggle with hubris. We struggle with this idea of self-centeredness. But there's a remedy for it. And, and it comes from this psalm. It's thankfulness. It's gratitude. It's being grateful and recognizing the things in your life. Because here's the thing. Uh, we're really good about being willing to be a victim right? When something bad happens to you, you're perfectly fine with saying, well, that happened because this person did it to me. That happened because the world threw this at me. That happened maybe even because God did it in my life, right? And I'm mad at him, right? When when bad things happen, we are more than willing to say somebody else did it. But when something good happens, it's, well, I I did that on my own, (laughs) I did that on my own two feet. I got the skills to pull this off. I'm the one who did this. No, no, nobody else was in the office until 9 p.m. That was me. And so when things that are good happen, more often than not, we're willing to be selfish, but, but then we have this idea of blaming others when bad things happen. But what if? What if we adopted this attitude of gratitude, right? And said, let's look at the blessings that we have in our lives as coming from something or someone else. Now, attitude of gratitude is a great little phrase that rhymes that every preacher ever has used, right? Um, But the idea behind it, what does it mean? It means intentionally taking the time to say thank you. Whether that be to God, actually praying that, saying it out loud, God, thank you for what you have given me. It's recognizing that you can't do it on your own and that you haven't done it on your own. It means intentionally thanking God. It means intentionally thanking other people in your life. Going to them and genuinely heartfelt saying, hey, I want to thank you for what you've done for me, for for being there for me, for for always helping out when I need something, for even just that one kind word that you said, thank you. It's acknowledging that. 
It's actually picking up the phone, calling somebody and saying, hey, thanks. I really appreciate you and appreciate the role that you have in my life. It's taking out a piece of paper. Yeah, they still make those. And pins and writing them. And there's this thing called the postal service. It's the craziest thing. You can put it in this box and it like just disappears. Kind of like an email, but like real. And so you can send a note of thanks. This person will just deliver it. It's amazing. You should try it sometimes. Um, But there is this idea of being intentional. Not just sitting here right now thinking about, I I should call that person. No, do it. Because when you start to say thanks, you're acknowledging that you're not doing it on your own. You're acknowledging that you can't do it on your own. And that hubris will start to slowly melt away. That arrogance will start to kind of like, oh, maybe I'm not as great as I thought I was. And I'm relying on the help of others in my life. I'm relying on the the help of, of God. Because all those skills, the the gifts, the opportunities, the the chance that you had to sit in that office until 9 p.m., because you have the gifts and talents and skills to be in that position, that all came from God. And so we give thanks to him. Which leads me to my second thing that really stood out to me. Perhaps, I'm going to guess at least for some of you, this particular part stood out to you as I read Psalm 138. And that is this idea of raising up thanks among the gods, like, among the gods, like, what are you, David, you feeling all right, buddy? Like, what are you talking about other gods? Like, you're suddenly worshiping Zeus? Like, what's going on? How are you talking about other gods? This is, what are you talking about, David? And I, I saw it, and I thought, okay, maybe, maybe David's out to lunch. What's going on here? So I did a little research, and it's fascinating, because the word that's used there doesn't help us at all. It's called Elohim. And Elohim is, in fact, the Hebrew word for gods. What's curious about the word is it's also the name given most often for God, like our God, the triune God. Like in Genesis, where it talks about God and the the spirit hovering over the waters, it's Elohim. See, I am at the end of a Hebrew word makes it plural. And so that's part of the evidence we use to pointing towards a triune God, pointing towards that we don't just have a singular God, but he is one in three in one, right? Um, But it doesn't really make sense in context to say, okay, I'm giving thanks to God among God. So there must be something else going on there. Some have said maybe it's referencing like the heavenly bodies, like it's angels, but then they would have just used the word angels. So largely it's speculated that he actually is referencing the cultural pagan gods, the gods that he would have experienced around him. And you're thinking, okay, well, what does that have to do with us? We don't really encounter that as much. Oh, oh, but we do. If you've been a Lutheran for any amount of time, you recognize the difference between lowercase g gods and uppercase g god, right? Making it a proper noun. Lowercase g gods are the things in our lives that we worship instead of uppercase g god. Let's take a look at what Martin Luther himself says about it. Anytime you can break out the Book of Concord in a sermon, what a day, what a fun day this is. Uh, this is from the Large Catechism. Uh, this is Martin Luther himself wrote this, and it's a lengthy section to read, but he, it's in fairly plain language. You should be able to track along. Um, this is actually in response to the first commandment, which is, you shall have no other gods before me. Here's what Martin Luther says. A god is the term for that to which we are to look for all good, and in which we are to find refuge in all need. Therefore, to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in that one with your whole heart. As I have often said, it is the trust and faith of the heart alone that make both God and and an idol. If your faith and trust are right, then your God is the true one. Conversely, when your trust is false and wrong, then you do not have the true God. For these two belong together, faith and God. Anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say that is really your God. He continues. So that it may be understood and remembered, I must explain this a little more plainly by citing some everyday examples of the opposite, uh, worshiping a, a false God. He says this, there are some who think that they have God and everything they need when they have money and property. They trust in them and boast in them so stubbornly and securely that they care for no one else. They too have a God, 
The word he uses here is mammon, which means money and property, on which they set their whole heart. This is the most common idol on earth. Those who have money and property, they feel secure, happy, and fearless, as if they were sitting in the midst of their own paradise. On the other hand, those who have nothing have doubt and despair, as if they know of no God at all. We will find very few who are cheerful, who do not fret and complain if they do not have mammon, money and property. This desire for wealth clings and sticks to our nature all the way to the grave. So too, those who burst, boast of great learning, wisdom, power, prestige, family, and honor, and who trust in them have a God also, but not the one true God. So basically, what old Marty Luther there is saying is whatever you put your hope in, that's your God. And there's a little test you can give yourself. I want you to think back to a time where you, you were having a tough go of it. You were just having a tough time. Things were difficult in your life for whatever reason, emotionally, financially, whatever, right? How did you get through it? Did you get through it by reassuring yourself and saying, it's going to be all right, we have money in savings? Did you get through it by saying, it's going to be all right? Maybe you lost your job, but I still have mine, so, so we'll be all right. Did you get through it by saying, at least I have my family that we can rely on each other? Did you get through it by saying, well, at least I'm smart. I'll land on my feet. See, all those things that you're putting your hope in, in the midst of that trouble, that'll be your sign that you're not worshiping the one true God. Now, none of those things are bad. Let me say that very clearly. It is not bad to have money and property, to have, to have intelligence and wisdom. It's not bad to have family, all those things. But when you put that above God, you're not worshiping the one true God. Where do you find your hope and your peace? See, we spend our entire lives focused on the lower G gods of this world. You spend an hour on Sunday worshiping the uppercase G God, but you spend, what, 40 hours a week more in the temple of the lowercase g gods, sitting at their altar, going to their every beck and call. You spend your time worried about the lowercase g gods. My friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, stop living lowercase lives. Stop focusing so much on the lowercase g gods of this world because they will let you down every time. Don't store up your treasure on this earth where moth and rust destroy, where, where thieves break in and steal, but instead focus on God. And it's not, I'm not saying that it's bad to have wealth and property. I'm not saying that it's bad to, to aspire to these things, but always keep God first. Focus yourself rather than on the lowercase gods of this world, rather than worshiping at the broken altar. Instead, turn to God and find your hope and your identity. Find your purpose in him. When you look up, stop focusing on the lowercase, but look up. You will see a God who is true, who is powerful, who knows you and who loves you, who cares for you above all, who knows everything about you and will never forget it. That leads me to my final thing that stood out to me. And that is a bit further on where it talks about how God, though he is exalted, though he is high, he reaches down to the lowly. Though he is almighty, he is beyond all. He is pure and clean and good. He reaches out to those who are broken and hurting and he cares for them. Nowhere is this more evident than in the ministry and life of Jesus. Yeah, in the Bible, there's, it talks about kings and it talks about religious leaders and they're all good and great and all that. But, but Jesus, when he's walking on this earth, he's reaching out to the lepers. He's reaching out to, to the tax collectors and the prostitutes, the ones that society says, no, no, there, there's a hierarchy and you're like way down here, buddy. See, the world's gonna tell you that you need to climb that ladder. The world's gonna tell you your identity is only as good as how high you can go when it comes to your status. And nobody can ride beyond here, right? You gotta be this tall to ride the ride. And so you have to keep climbing the ladder. But God, God doesn't care about your status. He cares about your heart. He cares about the purpose that you have, your identity in him. We have a God who is great, who loves you, who offered his son for you. The world is gonna take and take and take. 
And when you've given everything you've got to those lowercase g gods with with all the generosity you have, they're going to demand more. But our God doesn't take, he gives. He gives us grace and he gives us love. He gives us hope beyond this broken world. He gives us a life in paradise, not because of what we have won, not because of what we can do, not because of our hubris, but because of what he did for us. He gives. So my friends, as you go out this week, I pray that you can adopt that gratitude, that grateful heart, that you can see that, yes, as good as you are, as skilled as you are, as blessed as you are, and you should be proud of who God made you to be, it's not about you. That there are those in your life that you should be turning to and saying, hey, thank you for helping me get through. That you should be turning to God, that you should be looking up and saying, God, thank you for seeing me through this. I pray that you can stop living that lowercase life, worshiping at the broken altar of this world and know that there is so much more in store for you because our God, he will fulfill his plans for you. He has a promise for you. And maybe it's not realized in this world, but oh, there is something so much better waiting for you. And so we rejoice. We give thanks. I pray that we are able to give that thanks to the one who knows us, who loves us, whose steadfast love will never fail. Amen.